Thank you, Jesus! Yes! Yes! God! Dog, that's aliens. That's what alien. The fuck is that? That's aliens coming to the fucking. La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. That's. In the hallowed grounds of Israel, amidst the revered stones and bustling markets, whispers surge through the air like wildfire. Tales abound of an ethereal light descending from the heavens, accompanied by a haunting melody that sends shivers down the spines of even the most devout believers. Adding to the surreal atmosphere, a simultaneous earthquake threatens the safety of the dome, shaking the very foundation of Jerusalem, our cherished city. As the conflict rages on in the Gaza Strip with no sign of relenting, these enigmatic phenomena unfolding in the skies above Israel have captured the attention of observers, analysts, and seasoned scholars alike. It's bewildering to fathom that amidst this turmoil, Israel finds itself at the epicenter of a breathtaking celestial display within the sacred confines of Jerusalem, where centuries of prayers and contentious claims have unfolded. For the first time in over two millennia since his death, burial, and resurrection, the residents of Jerusalem find themselves in profound disbelief at reports of sightings of Jesus and an angel walking the streets. Is it a mere trick of the light? Jesus and an angel, framed against a cross, amidst a luminous glow with a throng of onlookers. Angels descending, crafting a scene unlike any witnessed in modern times. Were it not for the live pictures and videos captured by eyewitnesses, the news might easily be dismissed as fanciful, blasphemous or the product of imagination. Jesus, the King of glory, and a multitude of angels appearing in the heavens. Their arrival has ignited a sense of awe and anticipation amid the ongoing conflict. What does this remarkable visitation signify? And why has Jerusalem been singled out as the stage for this extraordinary event among all the cities of the world? Come with us as we delve into a remarkable event that unfolded one sunny day on the iconic Mount of Olives in Jerusalem, etching itself into the memories of all who bore witness. Picture this against the backdrop of the ancient city's storied history, a scene unfolds that defies belief. As if plucked from the pages of Scripture, a radiant figure descends from the heavens, draped in a luminous white robe, accompanied by celestial beings that shimmer with divine light. The first to behold this awe-inspiring sight are a band of pilgrims whose hearts leap with recognition at the figure's resemblance to the Jesus of their faith, as described in centuries-old tales and depicted in sacred art. The figure's flowing locks and intense gaze evoke a sense of profound spirituality, while the air around them seems charged with an otherworldly energy. For those who witness this ethereal spectacle, it's a moment of pure magic, made all the more poignant by its unfolding in Jerusalem a city steeped in biblical significance. But the celestial display doesn't end there. angelic beings, resplendent with wings that catch the sunlight, add to the wonderment, prompting tears of joy and fervent prayers among the onlookers. The news of the miraculous sighting spreads like wildfire, drawing crowds to the mount as social media buzzes with first-hand accounts and vivid images. While skeptics demand further evidence and scientists scramble for explanations, religious leaders and communities worldwide grapple with the profound implications of what transpired. Some embrace it as a sign of divine intervention, a fulfillment of biblical prophecy, while others tread cautiously, seeking clarity amidst theological debates. This isn't the first time such a celestial phenomenon has graced the skies of Jerusalem. Over the years, similar sightings have occurred, each time stirring hearts and igniting faith. As discussions and deliberations unfold, one thing remains certain the event on the Mount of Olives has reignited age-old questions about the nature of faith, the promise of redemption, and the enduring power of belief in a world filled with uncertainty. Witnessed by many with eager anticipation, the long-awaited moment unfolds in dramatic fashion, echoing the prophecies of the Bible. With Jesus' return described as a grand spectacle of power and glory, accompanied by a host of celestial beings, the appearance of Christ and the angels reverberates through the annals of time. What's truly astounding is that this manifestation occurs amidst the backdrop of intense conflict and turmoil in Israel. Before we delve into the profound implications of this divine visitation and the chain of events it sets in motion, it's crucial to understand the historical and religious context surrounding Jerusalem's significance. 
For Judaism, Jerusalem is the holiest of cities, with the Western Wall serving as a poignant reminder of its ancient heritage. Christianity, on the other hand, venerates Jerusalem as the sacred site of pivotal events in Jesus Christ's life, particularly his crucifixion and resurrection, embodied in landmarks like the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Meanwhile, Islam holds Jerusalem in high esteem as the third holiest city, with sites like the Dome of the Rock and Al-Aqsa Mosque symbolizing its spiritual legacy. Yet Jerusalem's rich tapestry of history and faith is marred by discord and contention, as disputes over its religious sites have sparked conflicts and diplomatic tensions spanning centuries. Despite its antiquity, Jerusalem remains shrouded in uncertainty, with archaeological evidence often contested or intentionally obscured. The deliberate destruction of ancient relics and archaeological sites, as evidenced by recent events, underscores a broader agenda aimed at erasing Judeo-Christian connections to the city's heritage. The complexity surrounding Jerusalem's history, archaeology, and topography fuels ongoing debates, making conclusive answers elusive. Yet, amidst the scholarly discord, the Judeo-Christian Bible stands as a beacon of truth, offering insights into the city's divine purpose and redemption's unfolding plan. Throughout Scripture, Jerusalem emerges as a potent symbol of God's sovereignty and humanity's redemption, resonating deeply with believers across epochs. As the world grapples with the enigma of Jerusalem, its imagery remains central to religious consciousness, serving as a testament to God's enduring presence and redemptive plan for all humanity. Despite resistance to the truth, the timeless narrative of Jerusalem continues to illuminate the path to spiritual liberation inviting all to embrace its profound significance in the tapestry of divine revelation. The narrative of Jerusalem intertwines with Israel's grand aspirations, symbolizing the destiny of God's chosen people. Let's delve into a unique interpretation of Jerusalem's future, a prophecy foretold centuries ago. The Ottoman rule over Jerusalem, commencing in 1517 and spanning nearly three centuries until the British liberation in 1917, aligns remarkably with ancient predictions. According to this prophecy, Jerusalem would endure eight jubilees under Ottoman rule, followed by a period of limbo before returning to the hands of the Jewish nation a pivotal moment heralding the Messianic era. The prophesied transition occurred in 1967, after the Six-Day War, fulfilling the Ninth Jubilee. Fast forward to the Tenth Jubilee, culminating in 2017, a year marked by President Trump's historic announcement recognizing Jerusalem as Israel's capital, signaling divine orchestration. This pivotal decision underscores God's hand in shaping geopolitical events, propelling the world towards the awaited return of Jesus Christ. Reflecting on these miraculous occurrences, it's evident that Jerusalem holds unparalleled spiritual significance as the epicenter of divine intervention. From the dawn of history, Jerusalem has been imbued with divine purpose, serving as the cradle of humanity's redemption. The significance of Jerusalem reverberates through biblical narratives, from Melchizedek's reign to Jesus Christ's earthly ministry, crucifixion, and resurrection a sacred lineage culminating in the promise of Christ's return to establish God's reign on earth. As we navigate through these profound truths, we're reminded of the convergence of history, prophecy, and divine providence all pointing towards salvation. While the symbolism of trumpets may evoke different reactions, to the faithful, it signifies the dawn of redemption and the fulfillment of God's promises. Conversely, to those opposed to God, it signals impending judgment and the demise of earthly powers. At the heart of this narrative lies the pivotal event, the second coming of Jesus Christ. This climactic moment, foretold in Scripture, heralds the culmination of God's redemptive plan, as Jesus returns as King of Kings and Lord of Lords to establish His kingdom on earth. As we contemplate these prophecies, let's turn to the Gospel of Mark, where the impending return of Christ is described amidst cosmic upheaval and divine glory. In Mark 13, we glimpse the imagery of celestial phenomena and earthly distress, culminating in the triumphant return of the Son of Man, a momentous event that will unite the faithful from every corner of the earth, under His divine reign. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. Luke 21, 25. Luke always has a slightly different way of saying these things. So these three places are a general overview of that period of time. 
and it mentions most of the major details of what's going to happen. There are heavenly signs that we've normally linked with the sixth seal in Revelation 6, chapter, verses 12 through 17. And it is immediately after the tribulation. We have often thought that the fifth seal, then, is the great tribulation, a time of great martyrdom of the saints. And if you want to look that up in Revelation, it is just before the sixth seal. There is also a great shaking here. In particular, it talks about a shaking of the heavens. But we will see, there is also a great shaking of the earth at the same time. It talks here in all three places about the peoples of the earth being in distress and being against him. They do negative things when they find out Christ is coming. They mourn. They fight. They are in great distress and fear because of expectation of what is about to occur. We also see Jesus coming on a cloud or in a cloud. It is one of the big signs throughout the Bible. It talks about him repeatedly coming in or on a cloud. Type of cloud you have seen in advance at the beginning of the video. There is also the sound of a great trumpet, or in other places it is a shout, when he sends his angels out, as it says in Matthew 24, 31. And the gathering of the saints, the elect, from the four winds, is another one of the big details here. So we basically have a general overview of everything that is going to happen at this particular time. Now, where do we go to find a little bit more detail? Well, Revelation is a good place. So we will go there. Revelation the 11th chapter, right after the two witnesses, I had to make my plug there. Because in a way, this sermon is just a continuation of that seven-part sermon series that I just completed. At the end of that story, the two witnesses are resurrected. And what do they do? They rise to meet Christ in the air. That is what happens at Christ's return. We are going to look at the seventh trumpet here. Remember that I said, in my sermons, that verse 14 is a transition to get the reader back to the time element that had been stopped at the end of chapter 9 for the digression through the insets chapter 10 and 11, 1 to 13. They did not follow the main flow of things, but the inset is necessary information to get you to understand the whole flow of events in Revelation. Revelation 11, 15, 19. Then the seventh angel sounded, this is the seventh trumpet. And there were loud voices in heaven, saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, we give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who was and who is to come because you have taken your great power and reigned. The nations were angry, but, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead nations actually, that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. And there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, and earthquake, and great hail. Now the seventh trumpet is a proclamation. It is also a plague. The lightning, noises, thunder, earthquake, and great hail sound like a plague to me. But there are still seven vials or bowls of God's wrath yet to come. The seventh trumpet announces the return of Christ and the reign of God beginning. And it has always been a curiosity to me that this is so, that this is the way that God set it up. That here, all of this is announced but there are still a great many bad things left to happen. Now, what has been a curious question to me is, how long do these seven last plagues take? The answer is, we don't know. If you go through chapter 15 and 16, I won't take the time to do this now. You will not find one time marker. All it says is, then this happens, then this happens, then this happens, then this happens. It's a seven times through the seven plagues. It seems to be consecutive, one right after another, sequential. But we don't know quite how long they take. Now, probably a good guess would be an entire year. If this is the day of the Lord and a day is as a year, then this would be one whole year of the seven last plagues. But it doesn't say that specifically here. So I guess you could say they could happen in one day? Probably not. But how long do they take? I don't know. All of these things take place in preparation for the return of Christ. In a way, it is like old-time warfare where they soften up the enemy before the invasion. 
They would set up their cannon and bombard the enemy from a distance before they sent in their ground troops to fight the war. In a way, that is what the seven last plagues are. They are the softening up of the inhabitants of the earth through terrible things. Sores, water to blood, scorching heat, darkness and pain. The Euphrates being dried up to make way for the kings of the east. And then, the seventh one is a huge earthquake. Let's go to that one. This is the seventh vial, or seventh bowl, or seventh last plague. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done, and there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake. Such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. Revelation 16, 17, 18. This is a Richter scale breaker of an earthquake. The whole earth shakes. Not just one little plate, one little section of the earth. This is the whole thing, as if God just reaches down and puts one hand on one side of the equator and his other hand on the other side of the equator, and he just shakes it for all it's worth. Nothing like this has ever occurred on the earth. Now the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon was remembered before God, like God needed to be reminded of Babylon and all their evil. Strange how things are stated sometimes, to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Then every island fled away. That's how big this shaking is, and the mountains were not found. This is an earthquake that can topple mountains and move islands. We've not seen anything like that, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent, and that's big. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. Revelation 16, 19, 21. They don't blaspheme him because of the great earthquake. It is because of the hundred pound hailstones that fall on their heads. I guess that is the last thing they do. Blaspheme God, and then they are flat as a pancake. I don't mean to be funny, but it is the impression I get. Now it is very interesting that this is very much like the seventh trumpet. The same thing happens. There is an announcement. And here, it is done. There, at the end of chapter 11, it was, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord, but here, there is another great announcement. And the same sort of things happen. Earthquake and hail. And I'm sure there will be noises and lightnings and those sorts of things as well. So we started with that sort of thing, and we end with that sort of thing. We just can't understand the immensity of destruction and ruin. It just boggles our minds at the power of God unleashed on the earth to announce the coming of His Son and to soften up the earth before the final attack. So Christ will descend amid shouting in a voice of an archangel and a trumpet blast. And as He comes, those who died in Christ will rise from their graves and be changed instantly into immortal, incorruptible spirit beings with bodies just like His. They will shine like the sun. Then, those saints who are still alive Many we hope in the place of safety, waiting for this wonderful event to take place, will also be changed, and together we will all meet Christ in the air as He returns. This is not a rapture. This is a resurrection. The first resurrection. The better resurrection. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Isaiah 61, 1, 2. Now, that is what Jesus said there in the book of Luke when he announced his ministry. Now, what follows is what is to come at his second coming. Continue in verse 2, Isaiah 61, 2. And the day of vengeance of our God. See, he is proclaiming the first time the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he says, the day of vengeance of our God. That's where we were in the judgment and all the gore and all that. To comfort all who mourn, now that's a little better. To console those who mourn in Zion, to give.